tonight. Renewed protest. West Bengal junior doctors resume strike over RG Khakes and demand action on safety. Iran's cost. Israel sends more troops into Lebanon as Prime Minister Netanyahu vows that Iran would pay for its missile attacks. Mexico's victory. Claudia Scheinbaum takes office as first female president in the nation's history of more than 200 years of independence. And olden glory. Combining the expertise of art and science, Spanish microbiologists train bacteria to restore old church frescoes. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Avadarana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Vinuth Varnasuriya. Well, very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We'll give the latest updates across the globe for this Wednesday. We kick off today's bulletin with some uprising tensions in neighboring India, followed by the latest developments on the Middle East tensions. Tens of thousands of people packed the streets of one of India's biggest cities after doctors resumed a strike and called a fresh rallies over the rape and murder of a colleague. The discovery of a 31-year-old's body at a state-run hospital in Kolkata two months ago rekindled nationwide anger at the chronic issue of violence against women. Doctors in the eastern city went on strike for weeks in response and walked off the job again on Tuesday, saying pledges by the West Bengal state government to improve safety and security at hospitals had been unmet. They were joined yesterday evening by thousands of people from all walks of life for a huge protest march with many carrying the Indian tricolour flag and some staying out until dawn. Rally organiser Rim Jim Singha said that they want to send out the message that their protest would not end until they get justice. Kolkata is days away from the start of a Hindu festival held in honor of warrior goddess Durga, the city's biggest annual religious celebration. Kolkata is days away from the start of a festival held in honor of the Hindu warrior goddess Durga, the city's biggest annual religious celebration. Singh has said that dozens of civil society groups backing doctors' calls for a public protest would use the occasion to demand an end to violence against women. Further adding, she said that the festival of worshipping goddess Durga epitomizes the victory of good over evil and this year it will turn into the festival of protests. The victim of the August attack is not being identified in keeping with Indian laws and media reporting of sexual violence is key. The victim of the August attack is not being identified in keeping with Indian laws on media reporting of sexual violence cases. Doctors had briefly returned to limited duties in emergency departments last month, only to strike again in defiance of a September order from India's top court to fully return to work. They say that the state government promises to upgrade lighting, CCTV cameras and other security measures in hospitals have not been fulfilled. Anger erupted on the streets of Karachi several days ago as demonstrators protested of the killing of Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah by the Israel forces. The protests which showed solidarity with Lebanon quickly escalated into violent clashes with the police. Now to update more on the tensions on the Pakistan streets, we have other than a world news special correspondent Ammar Gauss from Karachi in Pakistan. Ammar, what's the situation? Yes, ma'am. I'm here in Karachi, where the situation has calmed since Sunday's significant clashes during a rally that was organized by the Majlis Bahadatul Muslim. Nearly 3,000 protesters gathered in response to the killing of the Hezbollah leader Syed Hassan Nasrullah. And tensions escalated when some attempted to breach the police cordons that was set to prevent access to the US consulate in Karachi. Protesters clashed with the police, throwing stones and breaking through the barriers that resulted in injuries to seven police officers that required immediate treatment. The police then responded with tear gas and baton charges to disperse the crowd. While things are quieter now, many are anticipating further, further demonstrations in the coming days as strong sentiments regarding the Middle Eastern conflict still persist. Authorities remain vigilant, prepared for more protests, and the community is watching closely as to how these developments will unfold. We'll continue to update, to provide updates as the situation evolves. Back to you, Vinod. Thank you, and that was Adha Dhanabal News Special Correspondent Ammar Gauss from Karachi in Pakistan. 
On Armed Forces Day, President Yoon suk yeol said South Korea will build peace through military strength as North Korea's nuclear development and weapons of mass destruction threaten the nation's security. Well, this came as the military launched a new command to deter the North. The North Korean regime will come to an end the very day it attempts to use nuclear weapons. President Yoon suk yeol issued this warning Tuesday as he observed Armed Forces Day in an airbase south of Seoul and launched a new strategic command to curb North Korea's nuclear threat and weapons of mass destruction. The new unit will exercise integrated control over South Korea's key military assets, including the Hyunmo series of ballistic missiles, stealth fighter jets and 3,000-ton submarines. Building strength, the president said, is the only way to safeguard peace, not relying on the goodwill of the enemy. He further noted how North Korea has recently carried out low-level provocations, such as sending waste-carrying balloons over the border, conducting GPS jamming attacks, and engaging in illegal arms exchanges with Russia. He urged the North to abandon its delusion that nukes would ensure the regime's survival. Yun further said Washington is putting into action its extended deterrence policy of coming to the aid of its allies under nuclear or conventional attack noting that a U.S. strategic nuclear submarine visited South Korea for the first time in four decades and a B-52 strategic bomber landed on the Korean peninsula for the first time. Based on Seoul and Washington's alliance, Yoon also vowed to strengthen trilateral security cooperation with Japan. As Armed Forces Day marks the day in 1950 when South Korea, as part of the United Nations Command, advanced into North Korea during the Korean War. Yun thanked soldiers, veterans, U.S. Forces Korea and the U.N. Command for their service to this day. Updating you on the ongoing tensions in the Middle East now. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu promised that Iran would pay for its missile attack against Israel, while Tehran said any retaliation would be met with vast destruction. Ballistic missiles fired by Iran streaked over the sky on their way to Israel on Tuesday. Retaliation for Israel's campaign against Tehran's Hezbollah allies in Lebanon. The missiles are seen here over the West Bank's Hebron and in Tel Aviv with sirens blaring and air defenses intercepting the projectiles. Alarms sounded across Israel and sent people scrambling for shelter. Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps said the missile salvo was in retaliation for recent Israeli killings of militant leaders and aggression in Lebanon and Gaza. Israel said more than 180 missiles were launched. The attack drew vows of a sharp response from both Israel and the United States, with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu saying Iran made a big mistake and will pay for it. The Pentagon said U.S. Navy warships helped Israel intercept the missiles. U.S. President Joe Biden said Iran's attack was, quote, ineffective. Iran's foreign ministry said its operation was defensive and was only directed at Israeli military and security facilities. No injuries were reported in Israel, but authorities in the occupied West Bank said one man was killed there. Meanwhile, in Tehran, people celebrated the bombardment. Some hoisted posters of the recently assassinated Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah. Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, locked in nearly a year of war, also celebrated as the rockets headed towards Israel. The missile strikes come after Israel said its troops launched ground raids into Lebanon, which it has described as limited. But a ground campaign into Lebanon for the first time in 18 years, pitting Israeli soldiers against Hezbollah, Iran's best armed proxy force in the Middle East, would be a major regional escalation. The Lebanese health ministry said more than 50 people were killed and more than 150 wounded in Israeli attacks across Lebanon on Tuesday. Well, time for a short commercial break. More real news coming right after this. Stay tuned. On the road to the White House now, escalation in the Middle East crisis is affecting the race to the White House. As Iranian missiles rained down on Israel, the Vice President Kamala Harris was responding to the events in real time while Trump blasts Biden and Harris over the attacks. Well, for more details on this story, we have other than a world news special correspondent Ranusha Dharmaratna from Ontario in Canada. Over to you, Ranusha. Yes, Venut. 
President Joe Biden has confirmed the United States' unwavering support for Israel after Iran launched a major ballistic missile attack. The assault, involving 180 high-speed missiles, was largely neutralized by the U.S. and Israeli defenses. The U.S. Navy destroyers in the eastern Mediterranean played a key role in intercepting several missiles. Biden described the attack as defeated and ineffective, praising both Israeli military capabilities and U.S. assistance. He reiterated, make no mistake, the United States is fully, fully, fully supportive of Israel. Despite the success of missile interceptions, some strikes hit central and southern Israel with reports confirming one casualty in the West Bank. Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps claimed the attack was in retaliation for the killings of Hamas and Hezbollah leaders. The missile strike comes just hours before the U.S. vice presidential debate, adding the political tensions in the region. Former President Donald Trump criticized the Biden administration, stating the conflict was totally preventable and accusing the current leadership of failing to control the situation. With tensions rising in the Middle East, the situation is expected to significantly impact the upcoming U.S. presidential election in November. Well, that's it from my end. Back to you, Vinod. Thank you, and that was Adhir Naval News Special Correspondent Ranusha Dharmaratna reporting to us from Ontario in Canada. Just days after Helene left flooding and landslides in its wake, residents in North Carolina are trying to locate loved ones as search and rescue missions intensify across the parts of the southeast. The devastating Category 4 hurricane, which made landfall in Florida's Big Bend region, has killed at least 161 people and left about 600 people missing as of today. After Hurricane Helene left torrential flooding and landslides like this one in Boone, North Carolina in its wake. My car is gone. Residents scrambling this morning to locate loved ones as the search and rescue mission intensifies across parts of the southeast. The collision of these two homes among the horrific and widespread destruction across six states Flash flooding and mudslides devastating the mountains of western North Carolina. The former bustling town of Chimney Rock now turned into rubble, but residents there vowing to rebuild. Survivors of the storm growing more desperate for food and water since Helene barreled through. Gas lines a mile long, hundreds still unaccounted for, like Julie LaRoe. She and her fiancé, John Norwood, sought shelter at a neighbor's house when Helene hit, but a mudslide took out the home. John's legs crushed by ceiling rafters. Rescuers using a pulley to bring him to safety over rushing floodwaters. Julie hasn't been seen since. Thousands of National Guard members have been activated, racing to get supplies to the region. FEMA handing out food and water, defending its response to the disaster. The United Kingdom officially closed its last coal fire power plant, marking the end of coal use to generate electricity in the country. This marks the elimination of the coal power from the UK energy system for the first time in 142 years. The UK closed its last coal-fired power plant late on Monday, marking the elimination of coal from the UK energy system for the first time in 142 years. The Radcliffe onshore power station, owned by Uniper and located outside of Nottingham in England's Midlands, has operated since 1967. Uniper's chief executive, Michael Lewis, said on Tuesday that the move was a remarkable achievement, adding that the government must provide the right incentives and policies to encourage renewable energy sources. Now, Britain is the first G7 country to end coal-based power generation. Victoria Police have revealed they are hunting nine people over violent scenes at last month's Land Forces Military Expo that left police officers and horses injured. Well, a specialist task force has been established to look for those protesters responsible for the violence. Now, overnight, that task force has released images of eight people they wish to speak to in relation to their ongoing investigation into assaults and animal cruelty. They've also released an image of a man in a blue shirt. They wish to speak to him in relation to a council bin being set on fire on Spencer Street. 
27 police officers required medical treatment after projectiles were hurled at them. 12 horses required veterinary checks after a liquid irritant was sprayed at them, which got into their nostrils and mouths. 89 protesters have so far been charged or fined as a result of this violent protest that occurred here at the Melbourne Convention and Exhibition Centre last month. Moving over to Mexico now, Claudia Scheinbaum was sworn in yesterday as the country's first ever female president. She vowed to ensure security for investors and said that now is the time for transformation, now is the time for women. Scheinbaum, a 62-year-old climate scientist and former mayor of Mexico City, took the oath of office in the country's Congress as her supporters chanted Presidenta, using the feminine form of president in Spanish language for the first time in Mexico's history. She took over from outgoing President Andrés Manuel López Obrador, a close ally within Mexico's ruling Morena Party, which holds a supermajority in the lower house with its coalition, as well as a majority in the Senate. The incoming president used her inauguration speech to comfort investors, saying that assets will be protected so that Mexico remains a secure destination for international investment, while reiterating that a reasonable debt-to-GDP ratio would be maintained and that the central bank will be autonomous. In regards to the violence in the country, she is seen as likely to continue with Obrador's hugs, not bullets strategy of addressing root causes and avoiding direct confrontation with the cartels. Scheinbaum, who shared a Nobel Peace Prize with the former US Vice President Al Gore in 2007 for her climate work, is set to serve a six-year term until 2030. Earth's moon will soon have some company. A mini moon. The mini moon is actually an asteroid about the size of a school bus at 10 meters. When it visits by Earth, it will be temporarily trapped by our planet's gravity and the orbit of the globe. A second moon for the Earth, albeit only temporarily. Earth's gravitational pull has captured a small asteroid named 2024 PT5, which has become a so-called mini moon. Asteroids that become mini moons come within 4.5 million kilometers of Earth a phenomenon which, although fairly rare, has already occurred several times in recent years. Without a professional telescope, it is too small and too far away to be seen. According to the European Space Agency, after escaping from Earth's gravity in November, the asteroid is expected to pass by again in 2055. A group of Russian rescuers and volunteers were trying to save four killer whales stranded off the Kamchatka Peninsula. The rescuers were pouring water over them and trying to push them into the deeper waters. With a tide due soon, more than 30 rescuers were on site aiding two orcas and two calves, as the emergency ministry said on the Telegram messaging app. The whales got stuck in a silted estuary, making it impossible to use equipment to reach them. TASS state news agency cited the region's emergency minister Sergei Lebedev as saying the only way to help the animals now is to water them manually and that they are waiting for the waters to come. The Kamchatka region is a 1,025 kilometer long peninsula in the Russian Far East, some 6,500 kilometers east of Moscow. This week, it was announced that authorities in the city of Petropavlovsk in the region have launched night patrols to address the number of bears roaming the area. The city's acting mayor, Yevgeny Balyev, said that the city has never faced bears wandering into town like that and that it's important to ensure the safety of the residents of the city who are lucky enough to live side by side with wildlife. On Monday, an earthquake of magnitude 6.3 struck near the east coast of Russia's Kamchatka region, the German Research Center for Geosciences said. The earthquake was at a depth of 10 kilometers. A short commercial break now, more world news on the other side. Welcome back. And finally tonight, a mother-daughter pair of scientists is working on revitalizing a church using microorganisms to remove harmful substances that were previously used on it. It's just another day at work for this mother-daughter duo. But their office is this 18th century church, and they're using modern-day technology to restore it. 
Pilar Roeg and her daughter Pilar Bosch are both scientists who are trying to freshen up the look of this church while cleaning up harmful substances that have been used on it in the past. They say they use bacteria that produce enzymes to naturally degrade the adhesives. It's spread on the paintings and is left to sit for a few hours while it works its magic. When they wipe it away, the painting is glue-free and looks like new. It's truly a source of pride to be able to be here working with her and playing my small part in that project, finally. It took many years and so much research to make it happen, to turn it into reality, to a real work of art. So that work does not stay in a laboratory. The women say they use their work in the lab to continue the work their family's been doing for years. It runs in our family, so to say. My grandfather, my father, my uncle, my cousin. My cousins and I were all born with the dream of being a restorer. It's something essential that started in my grandfather's artisan workshop, and it had to end up as teamwork. Thank you very much for joining us on World News tonight. We'll be back with the latest upgrades from around the world tomorrow. Stay tuned as we've got Sanabi Mudan Nayaka join you next with the Nightly Business Report. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.